I have a time for you, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So tell me when the time is being kept. Are you keeping time now? Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, as you might know, uh, this stems from some letters to the editor of the local newspaper, uh, banding some he said, she said stories back and forth. And uh, now we're going to actually do some he said, she said scripted instead of just stories. And it's, of course, about does molecular genetics support human evolution. And most people have heard of the DNA molecule. Uh, if that sounds like a big word to use there, we're talking about DNA molecule, we're talking about chromosomes, we're talking about uh, genes and genetic sequence. This is uh, Richard Feynman. Uh, he was played by Matthew Broderick in the movie Infinity. He was the scientist who discovered how come the space shuttle blew up in the 1980s. And he says this about science, a very astute thing. Science is a long history of learning how not to fool ourselves. And I think anyone working in science has got to watch out for that. I think anyone going in any kind of an endeavor that uh, has any wiggle room for what's really happening and what's not needs to watch out for fooling ourselves. This is uh, Dr. Milford Walpa from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And he said this in the book Paleo uh, Paleoanthropology. I believe a physical, phys philosophical framework is not something that can be eliminated in order to provide objectivity. In my view, objectivity does not exist in science. Even in the act of gathering data, decisions about what data to record and what data to ignore reflect the philosophical framework of the scientist. If anyone tells you they're 100% objective, they're lying, at least to themselves. I'm not. I interpret all new scientific data through the creationary lens, the creation paradigm. But we have to watch ourselves with these uh, things that we have. Now, I attended the, the uh, talk by Richard Dawkins at the Fieldhouse a couple weeks ago, and one of the things he said coming from his paradigm was science answers the how question. The why question is just a silly question. The question is an inappropriate one. So here a question is being labeled inappropriate by a scientist. I also attended uh, when uh, Michael Roos spoke at the music building. He said about intelligent design, I'm not saying that it's a bad answer. I'm, I'm saying that it's not a scientific one. Some answers just aren't appropriate. So in certain paradigms, some questions are appropriate to ask. Some answers, though they might not be bad ones, are still inappropriate to offer. These things are ways that we can fool ourselves. Does molecular genetics support human evolution? We're talking about DNA, we're talking about DNA sequences, and we're talking about the evolution of human beings. This is a chart showing, yes, different kinds of apes, and then the human here. We don't disagree about what's above the tip of the iceberg. What we disagree about is how we all got here. Sure, chimps are very similar to us and, uh, and the, uh, the great apes, but how did we get here? Two different stories. Many evolutionary scientists have recently expressed doubts about the validity of molecular genetics evidences for evolution. This is Dr. Wolpuff again. He's in Science News Magazine this time in 2004. How many of you ever heard of mitochondrial DNA or mitochondrial Eve? Okay, so then you have some familiarity with what they're talking about there. Those who use mitochondrial DNA or the mitochondrial clock to reconstruct animals' evolutionary histories assume that its chemical sequence changes only at random, but mounting evidence indicates that natural selection molds the makeup of mitochondrial DNA, making such analyses useless because the clocks really don't run evenly. Also, I attended the lecture of uh, Dr. Solis, uh, who uh, spoke at the uh, Sam Noble Museum just a short while ago also, and she said on the molecular DNA clock, she said, we, don't, we know that it doesn't tick evenly, regularly, or the same in all species, and you wouldn't you know, trust a watch like that either. I'm not saying that they're totally off on this, but I am saying that some people are just vesting in hopeful thinking. Now, a lot of times evolutionists like to point out that humans and, uh, and chimpanzees are so very, very much alike. And it's true. We are more physiologically and structurally the same uh, to chimpanzees than anything else. Out of 3 billion base pairs, 1.23% is the only difference. That's still 36 million base pairs. 
but we still have, what is it, 98 some odd percent the same DNA as chimpanzees. Well, they look the most like us of anything. It's not so surprising that structure and genetic coding would be similar. But here's a nematode worm, microscopic, only has a thousand cells in its whole body, and this we have a 75% similarity with in our DNA. You know, all living things have similar DNA, some more than others. Now, here's the kicker, bananas share 50%, the same DNA as we do. Now, I'm not making this kind of stuff up, all living things do. Now, if those similarities between those very, very different kinds of organisms compared to us exist, then it's certainly not surprising at all. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we evolved from monkeys. If they were created the same time as humans, and they look a lot like humans, it's not surprising that their DNA would be very similar to humans too. So that issue is transparent to the entire thing about uh, evolution and creation, and whether humans evolved uh, from uh, chimpanzees or not. Now I wanted to emphasize that our DNA really is very similar. If you look at this here, here's a Here's a karyotype of uh, human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan uh, chromosome number 12, 13, and human chromosome number 2. And look what it says here. Of these four species, chromosome 6, 13, 19, 21, 22, and X have identical banding patterns. When you look at them through the microscope, you can see that these look almost like carbon copies of each other. Chromosomes 3, 11, 14, 15, 18, 20, and Y look the same in three of the four species, those being the gorilla, chimp, and humans, and chromosomes 1, uh, 2P and 2Q, which is the, uh, the human 2, um, and, and the chimp 12 and 13. 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12, and 16 are alike in two species. Only chromo chromosomes 4 and 17 are different among all of them. The biggest single chromosomal rearrangement among, for the four species is the unique number of chromosomes, 23 pairs, found in humans as opposed to apes. Now, this is something evolutionary scientists are fond of pointing out, that chimps have uh, 24 pairs, humans have 23 pairs, and that that second human chromosome looks an awful lot like the combination of chimp 12 and 13. Well, indeed it does. Now, what they're saying is that uh, chimps and humans were hanging around, and then these two fused, and look at how similar they are, and now in humans we've got just chromosome 2, which used to be chimp 12 and 13. Now, I have no problem, as I just said, with the chromosomes being very, very similar in, uh, in, in chimps and humans in the past, since we look alike anyway. But what evolutionists will say is that what happened was, Back in, back in the day when we had a similar number of chromosomes, these things here fused, made one chromosome, that's human chromosome number two, it's a combination of 12 and 13 from the chimps. There it is now, and it's all beautifully laid out. We can just see that proves evolution. It doesn't. The similarities actually could go easily, either way, for design or random evolution. The uh, fact that after after the creation or the evolution of these two species, that the humans fused chromosome 12 and 13 is not a similarity. It's something that happens that shows the species are separate. It doesn't show they were the same or chimps that have the fusion too. So my story is that uh, yes, humans and chimps did once have the same number of chromosomes. Humans had a fusion, but it never did happen. In the chimp line, it's an evidence of not being related, not of being related. So again, like I said, it's, the, uh, it's not the tip of the iceberg we're arguing about, it's how the iceberg got the way it is. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, there isn't evidence for a common ancestor as far as molecular genetics goes. DNA studies have forced the rejection of two of the great missing links that were in the evolution story, Homo erectus, or upright walking man, and Salanthrus chidensis, the Tamai child. Here we see in uh, Newsweek magazine of 2007, DNA makes clear that Homo erectus was almost certainly a dead end and not, as some scientists had argued, our ancestor. Trouble was, the Halanthrus chidensis, nicknamed Tamai, the word for child, lived close to seven million years ago. The genetic data pointing to a chimp-human split at least a million years later suggests Tamai is not the ur hominid, not the first creature ancestral, only humans, 
not our chimp cousins after all. So that knocks two of the members off the evolutionary family tree, and the other ones have their problems too, but these are the two that had the big problems with the molecular genetics. Now this textbook here, very popular high school biology textbook, does have these two species as missing links. Here you've got the uh, Sahelanthus chedensis, recent hominid discovery, the book was published in 2006. Here you have Homo erectus, also mentioned as a missing link to humans, and yet the Washington Post knows that uh, these were not human ancestors. The book even has a little part where the students can pick which of the stories of evolution they think is really true. The only difference is Australopithecus africanus is not listed in this one, but uh, Homo erectus is in both of them, and of course, as we just found out, Homo erectus is, because of the DNA, not a human ancestor. DNA studies have forced the acceptance of unlikely separate evolution of specific traits. It turns out the uh, way that uh, uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary paradigm scientists interpret the DNA structure of bats, for instance, uh, forces them to say that echolocation evolved at least twice on two separate occasions as much of a lightning strike hopeful thing that was to happen just once. Also, DNA studies have forced the acceptance of repeated evolution, then de-evolution of specific traits. And this goes against evolutionary uh, principles. This is the uh, uh, Phasma gigas, a foot-long walking stick insect. And uh, it says here in the Science News that stick insects may have done what biologists once thought was impossible, lose something as complicated as a wing in the course of evolution, but recover it millions of years later. Says uh, Brigham, let's see, that's not supposed to happen with so-called complex traits, at least according to a long-reigning view of evolution, which is Dalo's principle, says uh, uh, Michael Whitting of Brigham Young University. Yet that's the story revealed by the new family tree based on DNA data from 37 species of sick, uh, stick insects reported in uh, uh, 2003 Nature magazine. At the top of the DNA tree, wings appeared, seeming to have re-evolved at least four times on four different occasions. The wings popped back into the, uh, into the, the scene uh, via accidental evolution uh, up to, after up to 50 million years of winglessness. And it's the DNA studies, it's not like if you were an evolutionary theorist, an evolutionary mechanic a theorist, that you would want to say these kind of things, or want to see these kind of things. It's where their way of interpreting DNA has led them, and must lead them. Again, Dr. Feynman saying science has a long history of learning how not to fool ourselves. Um, I'm finding evolutionists are, are uh, uh, moving away from hard data, uh, going to more numerical uh, data, going to more highly complex mathematical models, rather than actual hard science. Um, I uh, did attend the lecture of John Beattie, also recently here at OU, and he said, if outcomes are chance, then maybe the laws are chance too. The laws of evolution could have turned out differently. And once they say the laws evolved, we'll realize those aren't the laws. The laws of nature, thought, comes from a time when science and religion were closer. We might have moved beyond the laws of nature. And of course, if, if a paradigm moves beyond established laws of nature and says it is above those laws, well then of course you can say anything. And uh, then I do think that we are not heeding <coughs> Richard Feynman's uh, uh, admonition to not fool ourselves. So that's what I had to say about molecular genetics and not supporting human evolution. Thank you. for arranging this for us. Um, I really don't get a lot of opportunities to have these kinds of science outreach opportunities. And I'd really like to because I know in Oklahoma there's a lot of contention between evolution and creation. And I think part of that is a lot of the general public doesn't understand why scientists get so worked up about evolution. Because, I mean, to the general public it's all, it could be like, an amoeba evolving into a frog, evolving to a chicken, evolving into people millions of years ago. Why, why is this such a big deal? Well, I use evolution every day in the laboratory in two ways. The first, um, I think some of you would call it a microevolutionary sense. 
I study the evolution of HIV in the hopes of creating a vaccine that will eliminate that uh, epidemic on this planet. And I also study it in a different way. Some, some of you might call it the macro evolutionary sense. And I do that in hopes of curing cancer and preventing cancer. So this isn't just about abstract things that happened millions and millions of years ago. It's a tool that scientists need in the lab to help people. So what do I mean when I say evolution? Okay, all I mean is descent with modification. So you're different from your parents, and they're different from their parents, and so on and so on and so on. That's it. If you carry that back far enough, you come to the exact same conclusion as Charles Darwin did 150 years ago. And that is that all organic beings have descended from one primordial form. And this was 150 years ago when we didn't have the technology that we have today. And he had this really cool drawing um, in one of his notebooks that actually recapitulates what we do in the laboratory when we're comparing one organism's genetic code to another organism's genetic code. So his insight really was astounding for the time. But how do we make trees like this? Like Mr. Jackson said, we can compare things that we have in common with other organisms. One of those things is the Pax 6 gene. So over the course of time, uh, as the eye was evolving, this particular regulatory gene can be found in people, in mice, in birds, in fish, in insects, to the point where you can actually take <laughs> the Pax 6 gene out of a mouse, put it into the fly's genome, and you get a normal fly with a normal eye. So we have things in common with other organisms. So to a scientist, we look at this and think, well, we had a common ancestor, and that gene got passed on from generation to generation to generation. But, like Mr. Jackson said, does that really support common descent? Because if you have a toddler playing with Legos, she can make a spaceship from that set of Legos, she can make a castle, she can make a dinosaur. If she's using the same building blocks to create different things, I mean, that doesn't mean that the castle is related to the spaceship. What really tells scientists that we are related to other organisms are these weird mistakes we have in common with other organisms. These mistakes don't make sense um, in light of any other paradigm than that of descent with modification from a common ancestor. One of these mistakes is what I study in the lab. They're called endogenous retroviruses. And I contend that if Darwin was never born, or if he was born and he decided to open a salon in day spa in Cuba or something. And, you know, every fossil remained buried. Um, if we managed to figure out how to sequence DNA, the second that we could compare genomes to one another, and we saw the way these endogenous retrovirus patterns set up in uh, all the organisms, then the step of modification would have smacked us over the head like a pillowcase full of doorknobs. So what are what am I talking about when I say endogenous retroviruses? Well, everybody has heard of retroviruses, of course, like HIV. Um, unlike humans, which you know we carry our genetic information as DNA, which gets turned into a message RNA that gets turned into protein. Retroviruses do things a little different. They go from a genome that's RNA, and then they turn it into DNA, and they sneak that into our genome. And so what happens is. is this virus becomes a permanent staple of that cell's genome. And it tricks it into thinking, oh yeah, this is a normal cellular protein. I'm supposed to be making this. Yeah, everything's fine. And they end up making all these viruses. They go on to infect more cells and wreak the havoc that we know of. Now, endogenous retroviruses, they're a mistake. Um, it's what happens when a retrovirus infects a cell that it's not supposed to infect, like a sperm or an egg. Um, normally they want to infect your immune cells or epithelial cells or something like that. But when they infect one of these sperm array, if they go on to participate in fertilization and that embryo um, 
doesn't die from the genetic mayhem that that virus causes. Then what happens is that permanent resident in that embryo's genome, that permanent retrovirus, gets passed on like any other gene, just like the Pax6 gene, just like the gene that says, you know, what color that embryo's hair will be. It's absolutely normal. So, when we look at the human genome, and we look for endogenous retroviruses, we see that some of them are unique to humans. We can't find them in other species. But some of them we have in common with other primates, um, with chimps, with gorillas, orangutans, with gibbons, with other old world monkeys, going all the way back to new world monkeys. But these aren't just static landmarks that evolution, that Scientists stated, well, oh yeah, evolution happened because of these guys. These endogenous retroviruses, um, it's a very unlikely event that one of these events happens, that a retrovirus infects a sperm or an egg, it goes on to be an embryo, it goes on to be a normal organism. But when we're talking about millions and millions and millions of years, random unlikely events happen a lot, <laughs> to the point where about 8.5% of your genome are these endogenous retroviruses. You're 8.5% viral, which I think is cool. Um, and so you've got tens of thousands of these retroviral genes in your genome. On the bright side, most of these are non-functional. Um, they've accumulated mutations, they've accumulated deletions and frame shifts. They don't work anymore, that's really good. Um, but unfortunately, there is a few dozen that can still code for a protein. Now your cells still have ways of keeping these guys quiet, but sometimes that doesn't work out. And what we found is that in basically every cancer we look at, we can find these endogenous retroviral particles coming out. So when you've got these retroviruses coming out, popping in, coming out, popping in, causing a lot of genomic instability, which leads to cancer. At this point, we don't know whether it's a cause of cancer or whether it's an effect that perpetuates cancer, but we need to understand these endogenous retroviruses and their place in evolution to just figure out what's going on so we can hopefully figure out a cure for these diseases. And it's not just cancer. Uh, they're associated with uh, multiple sclerosis and lupus and a lot of other diseases. So to scientists, this isn't just an abstract thing that, oh, we're just obsessed with a paradigm and we can't look at things any other way. It's really important to us. Unfortunately, the creationist response I've had to endogenous <coughs> retroviruses is baffling. Um, the Institute for Creation Research just says that endogenous retroviruses don't exist. When they speak about endogenous retroviruses, they say supposed or so-called or whatever. They're not real. Um, intelligent design creationists think that scientists are making them up. Like, uh, we're looking at this DNA code and like the beautiful mind, we start seeing all these patterns coming up of viruses. No. Um, viruses, uh, I think a lot of the general public think are like these alien, kind of foreign creatures. Um, they're actually a very diverse species, families. Um, so HIV is as related to the youngest retrovirus in your genome as we're related to green algae. So there's a lot of diversity in retroviruses. So when we say there's a retrovirus there, we know what we're talking about. Um, sometimes they say that retroviral insertion is a random. And that's absolutely a valid question because we know that humans and chimpanzees can be infected by the same retroviruses. That's how we got HIV. But again, they're forgetting the diversity of um, retroviruses and the randomness of where they insert in genomes. Um, just recently, uh, we found a very unlikely retrovirus in lemurs, um, a whole different species of lemurs. And so scientists thought, well, maybe this retrovirus inserted in a common ancestor of lemurs like 85 million years ago. And that didn't seem quite right to them, but it, it's a possibility. And they also thought it was a possibility that this retrovirus independently inserted in several species of lemur. So they didn't just guess or throw up their arms and say whatever, it's the older one. They looked at those sequences and determined that they were actually very different retroviruses. 
and that these were two independent events. So we know when things are random and whether it's common descent that is the more likely explanation or uh, independent in certain sites. Um, sometimes they say uh, ARVs don't work because not every organism has them. That's true. Um, plants don't have endogenous retroviruses. But they have things that are very, very similar. Um, and so we can work back uh, phylogenetic trees of plants using those weird mistakes. Uh, because ERVs, they aren't, they aren't the whole picture, they're just a part of the picture. And ERVs like, paint a big portion of it. And worst of all, some say that 8.5% uh, that of your genome that's retroviral, it's not really a mistake, they're all functional. And where they get this idea is that um, it's very, very cool. But we have mammals because an endogenous <coughs> retroviral protein was domesticated by your genome. So this retrovirus inserted, and instead of just having it delete itself into nothing, your cell was like, hey, this is, this is useful for something. And so all mammals actually use an endogenous retroviral protein to create a placenta. We exist because of a viral protein. I think that's awesome. The problem is, creationists take that to the extreme and say, well, because this one is functional, they all must be functional. They're not all functional. Um, we know what happens when you're infected with one functional retrovirus, AIDS. And so you don't want 8.5% of your genome making all these viruses. You'd get cancer, you'd get all sorts of diseases. It's a good thing these guys are junk. So why do I care personally about um, evolution in uh, classrooms and that sort of thing for kids? Well, because I'm not, I, I'm very confident in the education I'm getting here in Oklahoma. I love it. But I'm not vain enough to think that I'm going to cure AIDS and cancer personally. So I'd really like to use my career to advance scientific knowledge in my field and then have kids come up after me to be graduate students when I'm a principal investigator, to take over the labs when I want to retire someday. So that's why I'm here, and this is how we use uh, evolution. So we have a lot of time ahead of us, and so we still have uh, 10 minutes for rebuttal of each one. So, okay. Thank you. So let's see. Well, we do agree on a number of things, the similarities between lots of species and their DNA, uh, and some, also on some of the similarities between mistakes. Uh, one thing I will point out, uh, a point that, uh, that was made, is that uh, descent with modification is what evolution is. If that's all, just that I look a little different from my great-grandfather, then I believe in evolution. But you see, uh, uh, the difference was also drawn between microevolution and macroevolution. Uh, in the creation paradigm, there is a limit to how much change can happen just by reshuffling the genes that are already there. By evolution, new genes must be created, coding for new traits with new information, and thereby creating, as Darwin said in the title of his book, The Origin of New Species. Well, there are limits to the changes, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. Uh, point. Uh, we share these mistakes, these endogenous retroviral sequences in our DNA, 8.5% of our, our DNA being made of these things, and that this is some kind of a marker that shows that, yes, we're related to chimps. It does make an assumption. And I'm not saying assumptions are bad. In science, you must make assumptions when you don't know something. The assumption is made that the only way to really get these things into the genome and into the germ cell lines is by common descent. And that two separate species that never were separate shouldn't be showing the same endogenous retrovirus DNA sticking there in their chromosomes. Well, how many of these are actually orthologous? How many of these uh, Earths actually are the same ones and are on the same location? And uh, what are the chances of that being able to happen if there's 98,000 of these that exist in us, and however many in chimps, maybe 200,000 of them exist in us. 
Uh, let's take a look at something from, the, uh, from an article from last year from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. It says that, that uh, these things could go back 85 million years, according to DNA uh, clock testing that, that evolutionists use. Lentiviruses could be very ancient indeed, 85 million years. Now, viruses are known to mutate at, a, at an incredibly rapid rate, maybe a thousand times, maybe a million times faster than other uh, creatures' DNA, like yours. Now, if these viruses have been multiplying and, uh, and mutating at these incredibly accelerated rates for what uh, this article claims is 85 million years, well, a million times that is 8,500 trillion years. And that's in people years. That's different from dog years and people years. I'm talking about people years and virus years, okay? They've had the equivalent of 8,500 trillion years. And what are these lentiviruses? What are these uh, endogenous retroviruses today? They are still viruses. They haven't written any new code with new traits or new genetic information. They haven't advanced any. They've done exactly what the creationist paradigm said. By shuffling genes and by innovation of genes by accident, they can make horizontal changes, but they can never get past that limit to change that I was talking about. Until now, scientists thought lentiviruses, like HIV, were too young to have participated in this evolution back and forth. Well, just this past week, um, uh, I think this is probably the one that, uh, that we were just uh, referring to. The uh, two different lemur species in Madagascar that were found to have the same, and it's very clear, the two different species of lemurs in Madagascar suffered independently and, just about the same time, multiple germline infections. It says here that the whole thing was older than previously inferred by the DNA differences between past uh, uh, between what they see from the past in these, uh, in these now existing lemurs and what they see in living uh, viruses. And uh, they have independently two separate lineages, two separate lineages got this uh, endogenous retrovirus. Well, viruses can infect different species. It happens all the time. The, uh, our, the report here in uh, uh, Public Library of Science Genetics just of this week says, the viruses that were endogenized or, or got into the genome in the two lemur species were nearly identical. Yet, of course, these might have been 38 million years ago, uh, but today the, the sequences are nearly identical, showing that they are probably the same thing. Two different species of lemurs got the same cold or whatever it was. You know, isn't it possible that people and lemurs or people and chimpanzees could get the same virus at the same time and then those same endogenous retrovirus sequences can run into the genome and it can, yes, indeed, make it look like if your paradigm is that chimps and uh, humans have the same grandfather, it would look like that would be in support of that. Um, or it could happen, it could fit right in with the creation paradigm too. They both just simply contracted the same virus which then put the, uh, implanted the, uh, the retrovirus sequence into the genome. Again, this is transparent to the issue. How many of these things are actually at the same location on the same chromosomes? How many of them are, in other words, orthologous? They, they really are, or homologous? And how similar are they? I think this probably needs more research. I think you will see evidence that goes both ways easily in molecular genetics. I think you will see evidence that goes one way or the other. Personally, I think you'll see more evidence going the creation paradigm way, but evidence is not proof. It's stuff that helps you think that your opinion is stronger, but proof is what's needed in science. Data, logic, reason, and thinking. That's what we need. It's okay to have theories. It's okay to make assumptions. Those things are not wrong, but we should not teach them as though they're facts. And here's just a list of, of other viruses that uh, animals and humans both uh, can contract. And you can certainly have these viral DNA pieces, uh, sprigs, in both humans and animals of, of any of these in modern times. Thank you.
when a retrovirus, okay, retroviruses mutate really fast. Um, that's because when they are converted from RNA to DNA, the protein that does that doesn't have any proofreading mechanisms like our cells have. So, so they end up making a lot of mistakes. Um, and that's actually one of the points where mathematical models have really, really helped because you get so many variations with HIV that it's almost impossible to test them all in the lab. So math is also our friend. It's not a cop-out. Um, but once it becomes an endogenous retrovirus, um, it has the exact same proofreading mechanisms as our own cells have, which is actually pretty good. Um, and also about uh, getting new genes and new information. Um, I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. But uh, if you're really interested in how viruses can create new genes, Google uh, Abby Smith and HIV, um, because Michael Behe, an intelligent design creationist, made the claim that HIV is the super mutator and it can't get any new information, when in fact it kind of has. So Google that if you're interested. Um, but I want to talk about how our genomes get new DNA, because it's actually a really cool story. And I want to dismiss um, the kind of pop media culture claim about junk DNA while I have everybody's attention here. Uh, so when you hear a science reporter say something about junk DNA, it's always along the lines, a scientist thought this was useless and now it's got to function. That's not what junk DNA is. Junk DNA actually is a very specific definition that came up in the 1970s. It's a very cool story, I'm going to tell you all. So what happened was, um, Back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, a long, long ago, before we had all this really cool technology, scientists were uh, just figuring out that DNA is how inheritance is transmitted from parent to offspring. We didn't know that back then. And so they thought that these big, elegant, complex creatures like ourselves must have a ton of DNA, whereas we'd have more than, say, a dog, which would have more than a chicken, which would have more than a fish, or a ton of so they started seeing all these sizes of uh, the DNA they were finding, and uh, species of onion has twice as much DNA as we have. And a different species of onion has even more, and a different species has almost 10 times as much DNA as we have. And that's kind of degrading to think that this onion has all this DNA, why don't we have all this DNA? So, Sushimu so Ono. I thought it was a really cool idea, which has actually become a staple of uh, basic genetics. And he thought, since the fossil record was scattered with all these fossil remains of extinct species, maybe our genomes accumulate all these fossils of extinct genes. And so what he did was come up with the idea of gene duplication and divergence and pseudogenes. So gene duplication and divergence is one way that we get new information into our DNA. So for an analogy, let's say you just graduated from high school and from like some graduation party, you won a free computer. Awesome. You get home, grandma just got you a free computer. It, she bought it a while back, you can't take it back. You don't just want to sell it on Craigslist for 500 bucks. So you, you decide that you're going to make one of these machines, you're going to have it evolve into your gaming machine. So you get a sweet game, you get World of Warcraft, get a new monitor, get a new graphics card, gaming mouse, that's your gaming machine. Your other computer, you say, is going to be for school and research only, it's going to be your professional computer. So you keep all your data there, you get an external hard drive, nice professional case to carry it in, maybe some uh, presentation materials. So that's kind of what happens with your genome when you get a duplication and divergence. And this is what has happened with the evolution of the immune system. And so you have a particular kind of antibody um, called IgM. Really cool shape, it's the first one that's made. Neat, it performs whatever function you can possibly think of. But we don't just have this one kind of antibody. You have a ton of different kinds of antibodies that have been the result of all these gene duplications. And so you've got six, seven different antibodies that have been able to evolve in their own particular way. You have one that's functional, and one that gets to kind of explore sequence space to see if it can do something different. And that's precisely what happens. Um, so IgA, for instance, is really good for mothers who um, are breastfeeding their infants. It's really, really good to breastfeed because 
infants don't have a really good adaptive immune response yet, so they get antibodies from mom. Um, the IgGs are really good at attacking bacteria or anything that is invading your immune system, or invading your body. Whereas IgE, I don't know why this evolved. It's the reason we have allergies. I never had allergies, so I moved to Oklahoma. I'm not a fan of IgE. So where do we get these pseudogenes and junk DNA, what Susumu was talking about? Yay, TV computers. Ooh, you drop one and it smashed the screen. It is now what you might call a pseudo computer. Um, you can take some parts from it, you know, maybe a <coughs> spill pop on your keyboard, you can take the key keyboard out of your pseudo and maybe compensate. But it's not functional as a computer anymore. It's a pseudo computer. So to go back to ERVs, this is what happens to endogenous retroviruses. They turn into junk. That's good. Junk DNA in the form of endogenous retroviruses is great. So let's say in this particular GAG protein, GAG codes for the structural core of a retrovirus. In this one, we've got a frame shift. So we got a little insertion. The code doesn't make sense anymore. Um, polymerase codes for all the enzymes retroviruses need. This one's got a big deletion in it. And the envelope gene codes for the little spikes on the outside that um, the virus is used to get to your cell. This one's got a whole bunch of stop codons in it, so it's not functional anymore. It's junk. It's awesome. You don't want these guys functional. Um, but that's just one of the ways that you accumulate information uh, in, your in your genome. And even like these leftover bits of junk can still be used for other things. Like you can take the keyboard out of that junk computer and use it for something else. So these little LTRs, those are the promoters for the virus saying, like, hey, hey, come here, make these genes. They work really, really good. So sometimes your body's like, wait, this, this one works a lot better than the promoter I have. I'm going to get rid of my old promoter, use this one. So that's how you get new information. Okay, I guess we've got to the point where uh, question and answer time uh, is available to everyone. So let's just uh, open the floor up. If you have a question, offer it, and we'll uh, get some responses. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, they, everybody's talking about the DNA and stuff. But DNA is just half, half the, the puzzle. And, and how it's expressed, it's like you have two identical twins. One could develop a horrible cancer at 20, and the other one could live to be 103. You know how the data like. The environment affects the DNA. That's how you can have a one species a million years ago lose its wings because particularly the environment didn't call for it. A million years later, the environment's changed. The species, the, the code is still there. I, I, I saw stuff on TV where they they taken chicken embryos and made them grow straight scales by by tagging, you're making, I can't remember the word they use, but making the, uh, the old dinosaur DNA that's still in the, in the sequence, making it express. That's a really cool story. So like that PAX gene I was talking about that helps control eye development. Um, if you look at fish in caves that you know, have lost their eyes, everybody's seen those. It's a result of expression levels of that PAX. So PAX is still there, it's still functional. There's just a different protein that's been upregulated to inhibit it. So all those right genes are still there to make eyes. If, say, one of these fish gets transplanted out of the cave, they might. There's, there's no end goal with evolution, but they might acquire um, the capability to use their eyes again. Um, additionally, uh, part of my research is what you were talking about with uh, gene expression. It's called epigenetics. It's a really brand new field. I hesitate to kind of talk about it now, but um, one of the ways your genome keeps endogenous retroviruses quiet, like the really young ones that can still make virus, um, it changes how tight the DNA is wound up around these things called histones. You picture like eight beach balls stuck together. Your DNA wraps around it so it can fit into your cells. That's how come you can fit all this length of DNA in this teeny tiny cell. And so what happens when you want the gene to be expressed, you make little modifications to these histones, and the DNA kind of relaxes so the machinery can get in make RNA and proteins. And you don't want that to be expressed. You make different modifications that make that DNA snuggle up really tight. And actually we found um, dietary differences um, can affect 
how these modifications are made and how genes are expressed. So definitely there's another layer to the picture. Yes. It's for uh, Dr. Jackson. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, your presentation. It was really great to see your material of reference. That always is helpful when someone wants to research what's been said, you can go back and refer to it. So I very much appreciate you doing that. Um, in your presentation, of course, uh, you're a student, but uh, I'm from your point of view, so I, I like to research what you're saying, so I appreciate that up front. Um, my question is, you mentioned early on about with the uh, variations about human evolution, how you discounted, uh, I can't pronounce the Latin names of the, the two skulls that you pronounced, but you also mentioned uh, uh, Charlotte the Pithecus as three non human uh, leading to, well, not leading to human evolution. Okay? What would be the purpose of having something like that exist if they're, you know, for one, they die off, you know, uh, the species die off, you know, you know uh, continuously. We've had many uh, primates in the chains that have died off. But we do, and you admitted that with the apes, that with the non-human apes, that you do see common, you know, evolution with those species, but you disconnect that with what, you know, we call human or, you know, higher level apes, homo sapiens, <coughs> um, species. Are you saying, for instance, that those are just um, apes that lost out on the dice roll, or are you saying that humans are involved in this world of evolution, but not a part of it? I'm not saying that there's a world of evolution in any sense of the word at all, except change uh, within limits. But uh, when I'm talking about uh, species like this, I'm talking about, yes, extinct monkeys. Uh, for instance, how many ever heard of Lucy? The Lucy fossil, that's Australopithecus afarensis. Lucy here is in the middle of this uh, chart, which uh, comes from uh, Newsweek of uh, 2007. It's very, very recent, uh, up-to-date information. And you can see that the uh, shaded areas are the period where the species is known to have existed based on fossil evidence. This is actually the layers in the rock. Evolutionists would call these millions of years, four million years, five million years, six million years, seven million years ago. And it's at this depth in the rock that Lucy was found. The uh, white shaded area represents actual evidence, facts, data, which creationists do not disagree with. You know, a lot of people think creationists don't believe in dinosaurs, and we, that we don't believe that these little monkeys existed. Creationists believe that the creator made humans, and monkeys, no monkey humans. But we do have a whole lot of different kind of monkeys that are extinct now. And Lucy would be one, three and a half feet tall, 65 pounds, and a brain one third the size of ours, sounds like a monkey, and couldn't walk upright like a human. Then there's the Sahelanthropus chedensis that we mentioned, and Homo erectus is out of the running, those two uh, because of DNA. And to all of these are actually, these are a side branch that evolutionists never did think we evolved from. Uh, Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthal man, is now considered a Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, just a subspecies of us. Uh, their brains were bigger, they could talk, they had art, religion, and music, and uh, they were not, uh, in any sense, some sort of missing link. Heidelberg man has just recently, since this article came out, been reassigned the designation of an archaic Homo sapiens. Uh, notice there are no dotted lines in the imagined flow of evolution leading from Lucy to Homo sapiens, us. There's a break right here. A problem with Africanus is that it, it's a million years later in the story, but looks more like a monkey than Lucy does. National Geographic just said evolution just went backwards. You see, to answer your question, I'm seeing these as extinct monkeys, like extinct dodo birds, the extinct European lion, the moa, and the T-Rex. There are many different kinds of creatures that did diversify, but within those limits that microevolution has. And that these things are not monkey people, 
they're either people or monkeys. It's clear this is a person. We're still fighting over what the uh, Isle of Flores uh, hobbit fossils really were, probably uh, uh, acromplastic dwarfs, or maybe they were microencephalic, and there was a gene there. I'm still wondering what they really were, but they seem to be intelligent and people, even though they were short like hobbits. And so, really, there's nothing left. This is now an uh, archaic human. The only thing left in this story that hasn't been shot down by different uh, analytical techniques as being the missing link is Homo antecessor. And you can see that the bar for how much actual data uh, exists to substantiate what it was like it is very, very slight. So uh, I, I, I don't I hope I didn't go too over, but I hope I also did answer your question. How do I see these things? Extinct monkeys. Where, where did this chart come from? Here. Okay, thank you. You keep talking about the, the missing link, but the stuff I've read, there's no such thing as a missing link. It's, you know, our domestic dogs today are still directly related to wolves. You know, they, they can still breed with each other. But you can look at a wolf and you look at a teacup chihuahua, if you just had these two fossils, you think, well, there's no way. The words a missing link. There is no missing link. I mean, they, it, it's, it's, it's breeding. You know, and they're still species. I mean, they're not speciated with each other. They can still breed wolves and dogs together. You're right. And, and, but it seems like the main uh, gist of your argument here is, is evolution too complex to come up with, with I mean, is, is you know, um, a bunch of protoplasm floating around in, in, the, in, the, in the soup. It's, life is too complex to be come from there to here in you know, 3.5 billion years? Is that, is that the gist of your argument? Oh no, I would never say that the complexity issue is the downfall of evolution, because evolution has a theory about the complexity. It is based on the assumption that uh, random mutations can write new genetic material that actually makes sense above and beyond the way the species was to begin with. Natural selection could then weed out things that worked and keep things that did. But natural selection, uh, it's been said, can explain the survival of the fittest. It can tell you why certain wildebeest survive. They're faster, can run away from the lions. But how you got wildebeest and lions in the beginning cannot be explained by natural selection. It only is a screening process, and it's not a creative process. Even Jay Gould said that. And so what still remains in the evolution theory is how to produce the raw material for evolution. What I'm saying is, for natural selective work, what I'm saying is that complex or not, you can't get uh, even moderate complex code to be written that's meaningful when you tamper with it by accidental mutations. I can see it happening in viruses. We see it all the time. We observe that. I can see it happening in bacteria to some extent, a lesser extent. We do see that. We don't see, uh, and, and, and indeed if you were to dig up a teacup chihuahua and a, a timber wolf, you would never think that those two were related unless you somehow did the DNA testing and found out. Uh, of course, there are mechanical reasons why timber wolves and chihuahuas don't mate. There, there are social reasons why they don't mate. They would probably one would have the other for a meal instead is what would happen. But uh, wolves, hyenas, jackals, foxes, and dogs are, are all interfertile. We would say as creationists that the creator made dogs, and that was them. And two dogs got off Noah's Ark, and we got all these things and could get all these things because dogs are so very plastic in their, in their genetics. They're so variable. 